Good day, my dears. Welcome back to Menopause University, where we address everything there is to know about menopause. <laughs> this is video number 354, and it's the very last video in our unit on cervical cancer, which began in video 340. Just before we embarked on cervical cancer, I gave you a big unit on endometrial uterine cancer, and that unit encompassed videos 320 through 339. And each video is the next step in understanding wherever, whatever we're studying, and that's why it's ultra critical to watch all my videos in order. I work so hard to ensure that you understand everything, and that's the only way you're going to understand everything. And this unit on cervical cancer isn't even in my book. So this YouTube channel is the place to learn about cervical cancer. The reason I thought it important to include a unit on cervical cancer here on YouTube is because your cervix is part of your uterus. The cervix is here, the uterus is here, but it's all one organ. But despite the fact that your uterus and cervix are part of the same organ, the cancers that develop in the two locations are very different. And this video addresses that. It's entitled, The Uterus and Cervix, One Organ, Two Very Different Cancers. Now, in video 340, which began this unit on cervical cancer, I actually gave you an overview of the differences between endometrial uterine cancer and cervical cancer. But back then, you didn't know anything about cervical cancer. And now that you're practically an expert on cervical cancer, we need to dive more deeply into the differences between these two cancers. So you might recall seeing this chart in video 340. This chart lists 10 factors of comparison for the two cancers in the first column, and you see that endometrial uterine cancer is in the second column, while cervical cancer is in the third column. In video number 340, I gave you a tidbit on each of these factors, so I'm not going to rehash all of that today. Instead, I want to focus on the similarities and differences between these two cancers. And if you haven't watched these videos in order, and especially if you haven't watched video number 340, you will not be ready for this video. <laughs> Please believe me on this. And instead of beginning with the similarities between endometrial uterine cancer and cervical cancer, I'd like to begin with their differences. However, we'll still follow the order of factors listed on the chart. So looking at the first factor, the incidence of the two cancers, you see that endometrial uterine cancer is the most common gynecologic cancer and cervical cancer is the second most common gynecologic cancer. But let's address why that's the case. Historically, cervical cancer was by far the more common of these two cancers. Back before anyone knew what caused it, middle-aged women had cervical cancer that was diagnosed at very late stages with dismal prognoses. Before 1978, death from cervical cancer was common. So cervical cancer was both common and deadly worldwide. But endometrial uterine cancer, which used to be less common than cervical cancer, has increased in incidence. In essence, the two cancers have traded places. Can you guess why? Well, think back about what I've told you regarding the causes of these two cancers. Cervical cancer is due to HPV infection that women acquire at young ages. But with pap smears, HPV tests, and the ability to treat cellular changes at the pre-cancerous stage, we don't see much cervical cancer in any part of the world where these things are available. But endometrial uterine cancer is caused by unopposed estrogen. Back in the early 1900s when doctors first started giving estrogen replacement to all women for menopause, they had no knowledge of the fact that estrogen was the cause of endometrial uterine cancer. 
So for the first few decades, they gave women estrogen only without progestogen because estrogen is the female hormone and estrogen deficiency is what menopause is all about. It wasn't until women taking estrogen all by itself developed endometrial uterine cancer that they discovered estrogen as the cause. So that's when they started giving both estrogen and progestogen. And that caused the incidence of endometrial uterine cancer to decrease. But what's the other most common source of unopposed estrogen? Your fat cells. So at the same time doctors started lowering the incidence of endometrial uterine cancer by adding progestogen to estrogen, women started getting fatter. And all that fat has offset some of the decreased incidence from progestogen. Do you see how this makes sense? So now that we've greatly reduced the incidence of cervical cancer, we have not done as good a job with endometrial uterine cancer. And that's why it's still the most common gynecologic cancer. Now, the second item on the list has to do with prototype. Another big difference between these two cancers is the kind of woman who gets them. On our chart, you see that old, fat women get endometrial uterine cancer, while young, sexy women get cervical cancer. This is clearly in keeping with what causes each of these cancers. Old, fat women have fat cells that produce estrone. The estrone stimulates the glandular cells of the endometrial uterine lining and causes them to transform into cancer cells. It's rare for a woman with a uterus to take estrogen without progestogen these days. That is, as long as her menopause manager knows what he or she is doing. But it's still very common for young, sexy women to have sex and get infected with HPV unless they've had the vaccine. So this difference in the kind of woman who gets these two cancers has not changed, and it probably never will. Okay, going on to the third item. If you now consider the risk factors for these two cancers, you see that they are also quite different. The risk factors for endometrial uterine cancer are being old, being fat, and taking or making excess or unopposed estrogen. The risk factors for cervical cancer are being young, being young at the time of your first intercourse, having more than one sex partner, having a history of a sexually transmitted disease, having many pregnancies, cigarette smoking, immune suppression, DES exposure, diethyl cholesterol, having a history of abnormal pap smears, having infrequent pap smears, and living in an underdeveloped country. Hugely different, aren't they? I think those are striking differences for two cancers that occur in the same organ. They are so different that it's unlikely that one woman would ever have both cancers. And one of the reasons that's the case is the next factor, cell type. The type of cell that becomes cancerous is completely different for the two. For endometrial uterine cancer, it's an adenomatous glandular cell that becomes cancerous. This makes sense given the fact that the cause of this cancer is estrogen. Glands secrete and respond to hormones. So a gland cell is a big cushy cell like this. And another name for such a cell is an adenomatous cell. That's why the resulting endometrial uterine cancer is called an adenocarcinoma. But cervical cancer starts in a skin cell, also called an epithelial cell. It's the skin cells on the outside of your cervix that are exposed to your vagina that become cancerous in cervical cancer. And instead of being big and cushy, they're flat and stiff 
They're made for withstanding the trauma of all the things that go on in your vagina. These skin cells are also called squamous cells. So the cancer that develops from these cells is squamous epithelial carcinoma. And in the unit on cancer in general, I taught you that cancers have personalities based on the kind of cell that becomes cancerous. So this big difference in the kind of cell that becomes cancerous for these two different cancers dictates a lot about how they behave. Next on our chart of factors, we have cause. And we've already touched on this. It's simple, really. Estrogen causes endometrial uterine cancer, while HPV causes cervical cancer. I don't think there's a need to say more about the difference than that. One is caused by a hormone, and the other is caused by a virus. Big difference. The next two factors on our list are not differences. They're similarities. So let's skip them for now and move on to staging. Now, comparing staging for the two different cancers has little real meaning. All staging systems reflect progressive spread of the cancer. But I think the biggest difference in these two staging systems lies in stage three. For endometrial uterine cancer, stage 3 encompasses your entire pelvis. But for cervical cancer, stage 3 pertains to just your vagina. Your pelvis includes a whole lot of structures, while your vagina does not. But other than that, it's really difficult to make sense of this comparison. But it does make you realize that cervical cancer is the more aggressive of the two cancers. And that is further elucidated by the next factor, which is treatment. While both cancers demand different kinds of treatment depending on stage, the primary modes of treatment differ for the two. For endometrial uterine cancer, treatment is primarily surgical. Here's the treatment chart we created in video 329 on treatment for endometrial uterine cancer by stage. As you can see, surgery constitutes the primary mode of treatment for all stages other than stage 4. But in video 350 on treatment for cervical cancer, our chart looked like this. And here you see that radiation therapy surpasses surgery as the primary mode of treatment as early as stage 2. So that tells you something about the personality differences of these two cancers. Endometrial uterine cancer behaves in a way that makes it amenable to surgical removal, while cervical cancer does not. Generally speaking, cancers that can be treated surgically are less aggressive than those that cannot be treated surgically. And finally, we have the five-year survival rates for the two cancers for our differences. Stage for stage, these differ significantly. This is another factor that tells you something about the personalities of these two cancers. Stages two and three exhibit the greatest differences. Five-year survival for stage 2 endometrial uterine cancer is 75%, but it's only 66% for cervical cancer. And five-year survival for stage 3 endometrial uterine cancer is 55%, whereas it's only 33% for cervical cancer. Overall, the survival statistics are much better for endometrial uterine cancer than they are for cervical cancer. And that does it for the differences between these two cancers. But what about their similarities? The only factors that are similar for the two are pathological process and mode of spread. They're halfway down the chart in aqua and dusky blue. They both follow the very same pathological process of normal cells that transform into hyperplasia, that then becomes atypical hyperplasia, that then becomes dysplasia, 
and the dysplasia becomes neoplasia. Both of them are the same. And they both grow by local spread rather than via your lymph or blood. So this personality trait is the same for the two cancers. But you know what? There is yet another similarity that is not obvious and is not on our chart. And in my opinion, it's the most significant one of all. Can you think of anything else about endometrial uterine cancer and cervical cancer that constitutes a similarity between them? I'll give you a hint. It has to do with our ability to diagnose them early. <laughs> my, 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 I can just hear your guesses. <laughs> Did you say that it's because they both have a screening test? Nope, that's not it. They both don't have a screening test. A screening test is something you do on all women, regardless of symptoms. We do have not one, but two screening tests for cervical cancer, but we do not have a screening test for endometrial uterine cancer. Oh, did I hear you guess that they both have a diagnostic test? Nope, that's not it either. <laughs> it is true that they both have diagnostic tests. For endometrial uterine cancer, it's ultrasound and endometrial sampling. For cervical cancer, it's colposcopy and biopsies. But there's something else that is even more profound in terms of the similarities between these two cancers. It's that we know the cause for both of them. Cause! Cause is everything! I cannot overemphasize the value of knowing the cause of a cancer. It changes everything. It gives you power to control the disease. It enables you to diagnose it early. It enables you to cure it. And it enables you to prevent it. If only the research efforts for cancers focused on cause rather than cure, we'd be way ahead. You know, it's a lot like what you've learned about menopause itself. You've learned that it is due to estrogen deficiency. Everything you experience is a result of estrogen deficiency. So estrogen deficiency is the cause. For your menopause management, you can either focus on each and every symptom or disease individually, or you can focus on the underlying cause. Any time you manage something by eliminating the cause, you will get better results than if you focus your efforts on cure, and you will reduce the incidence of the disease. So knowing the cause of a cancer has great positive consequences. That's why I think we should have cancer runs from the cause instead of cancer runs for the cure. So in summary, endometrial uterine cancer and cervical cancer are two very different diseases in the same organ. And while they have more differences than similarities, the one thing that is most significant about both of them is that we know the cause for both. And knowing the cause is what has enabled us to reduce the incidence of both. All the charts I showed you today are already available on my website, menopausetaylor.me, in association with their original videos. If you're watching these videos in order, you've already seen them all and maybe even collected them all. If you go to menopausetaylor.me, go ahead and schedule a consultation with me. It will make all the difference in the world for your future. There's no way I can tailor things specifically to you in a video the way I can in a consultation. Newsletter subscriptions are easy, right here. So are subscriptions to this channel. Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram are pretty easy too if you just want to follow me. I will see you again in a week with a surprise topic. <laughs> Bye! <laughs>